good morning guys um welcome back to youth service uh at zoom um uh maybe before we begin um our worship uh let's just take the time to pray dearly father thank you for this day thank you that um we're all gathered uh, again today um on this present at the meeting and um for youth service and just want to pray and commit this time to you that um amidst the the, the COVID-19 situation that you continue to keep us uh uh, together and united. I uh, just want to pray that um, as we come to worship you, we'll sing with our hearts and that um, remember that you're in control of all this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. First song we'll be singing is uh, Holy is the Lord. We stand up. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. We shall bless the Lord again. Stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He, and together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. It's rising up all around. It's the end of all the Lord's renown. It's rising up all around. It's the end of all the Lord's renown. And together we say, Everyone say, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. The next song we'll be singing is actually a new song. Um, it's a song that um, I found when I was just trying to search for new worship songs to sing and um, never got the chance to, uh, to do it during um, a normal youth service in church. But um, I think it's a really good song and um, I don't think um, just because um, our current setting is less, is less than a band that it is not able to be sung and sung well. Um, so this is a uh, run to the father. I 
hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see it now. I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. You saw my condition Had a plan from the start Your son for redemption The price for my and I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand. I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. I run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with a high day, breathing away. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again. My heart, my heart has been in your sight long before my first breath. Running into your arms and running to life from death. I feel the rush deep in my chest. Your mercy is calling out just as I am. You pull me in and I know I need you now, my heart. My heart has been in your sight long before my first breath. Running into your arms is running to life from death. And I feel this rush deep in my chest. Your mercy is calling out just as I am. You pull me in, and I know I need you now. I run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that. Um, thank you for this time of worship, and I just want to pray that um, as you, um, as uh, Pastor Gabriel leads the sermon later on, I just want to pray that um, you will anoint his lips, and that um, everyone here will have uh, attentive ears and attentive hearts, and um, just want to pray um, yeah, that uh, uh, for the rest of the, the circuit breaker season, that we'll continue to look to you, continue to stick to you, even though... Um, uh, times may be feeling low and dim. Uh, Jason, you pray. Amen. Just like to pass the time over to uh, to Ethan. Hello. If you all can hear me, can you give me a thumbs up? <laughs> okay. So, hello everyone. Welcome back to Zoom U service. Um, even though we may not be able to meet each other in person, it's still nice to welcome each other online virtually. So, 
Can you all just give a small little wave to the camera and welcome everyone here today? Okay, nice to see all of you up in the morning. Okay, hope no one else is sleeping now. Okay, so thank you all for coming for youth service today. And I'll now pass the time over to Pastor Gabriel to deliver today's sermon. Good morning, Kamu Youths. It's great to see all of you on Zoom once again for this Sunday. And we are well into the second week of Circuit Breaker. wonder how you're doing. Uh, I hope that you have been having good quality time with your family and also for the students. I hope that home-based learning has been treating you well. So I understand that this can be a pretty challenging period for all of us as we are confined to our homes. Uh, for some of us, life can be pretty monotonous and as the day goes by, uh, pretty boring. But I pray that this will be a time that we can really treasure together uh, with your family and that we can really put this time to good use. So one of the things uh, I've been doing, just like to share uh, during this period, is reading. Okay, so I, I got this whole series of theological books a couple of months ago, and it has been on my shelf. And I've never got down to actually reading them until this circuit breaker period. And interestingly enough, our sermon today actually is something that emerged out of this book that I'd like to share with all of us. Right? Um, it's called A Matrix of Meaning, Finding God in Pop Culture by Craig DeWeller and... Barry Taylor. So this is a book that talks about how God can be found in pop culture, such as music, movies, and art. And so thanks to this idea, from the ideas from this book, you know, we can look at the Avengers today and we look at Batman last week. So today I'm going to launch a new sermon series called Avengers Infinity War. Infinity Walk, sorry. So if, if you are an Avengers fan, or you have watched the Avengers movie, now is the time to give me a thumbs up on your reaction button. <laughs> I hope everyone is familiar uh, with the Avengers, but if you're not familiar with the Avengers, it's fine. Uh, you'll still be able to follow on, along in my sermon. Right, so, but this, this is a sermon series um, where I'm going to take just one character of the Avengers each week. And we're going to use this character to help us uh, understand you know, and expect of what it means to actually walk with God. So hence, I titled this sermon series a pretty important title, right? Uh, Infinity Walk. This sermon series is really about our walk with God. It is a series I hope that we're not just going to be ex excited about the Avengers, okay, but we are going to be excited about our walk with God. So this month, let me just give you a timeline. We have two sermons. Okay, we'll look at Nebula this week and then Captain America next week. And then we're going to take a break from the months of May and June. And then we're going to launch part two of Infinity Walk in July. Okay, we'll talk about Iron Man, Spider-Man, and then Black Panther. So hopefully by July, this whole circuit breaker will end and then we can have part two back at our Joy Chapel. Well, today I'm going to just take a look at a very minor character in the Avengers. But this minor character is going to help us answer a very major question. And that minor character is none other than Nebula. Okay, so let's put Nebula here. She stands. And this minor character in the Bible is going to help us look at this very important question. Sorry, let me just change my slides. This very important infinity walk question. How can we overcome sin in our lives today? Right, this is a pretty major question in our walk with God. How can we overcome sin in our lives today? And interestingly, this sermon is going to be somewhat like a part two from last week's sermon on the cross in the dark night. It is probably only time where DC and Marvel meets in a good way. 
So in last sermon, on Easter Sunday, we look at what Jesus did at the cross and through the lens of Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight. We saw how Jesus Christ became the substitute. He paid the penalty for our sins. And we saw how much Jesus Christ loved us, how far he was willing to go for us. And we saw how Jesus became our wrath absorber. He took the bomb of God's wrath and he became our propitiation. A big word there. Okay, but this morning, we're going to move from DC to Marvel. And we're going to take a slightly different look at the cross. Well, last week, we looked at what Jesus did at the cross. This week, we're going to look at what the cross did to us. What the cross did to us. And knowing what the cross did to us is going to help us answer the question, how can we overcome present-day sins? The sins in our lives today. How can we overcome the sins in our lives today? And it goes down to what the cross did for us. And the answer is found in a pretty profound chapter in the Bible, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. We're going, we are going to go there uh, in this sermon this morning. And this is a chapter that's going to tell us the effective solution to the sins in our lives today, the effective solution to all our present sins that we commit today. And because this is a very deep and profound chapter, it's going to be a very difficult chapter to understand without an illustration. So what I'm going to do is to use Nebula and her story to illustrate what Romans chapter 6 verses 1 to 14 is actually saying. But before that, let us just uh, commit this time to God in prayer. Let us pray together. Let us seek God and ask Him to grant us understanding to His Word. God, we are about to approach a pretty challenging chapter in the book of Romans. But God, um, although it's challenging, although it's deep, God, is essential truths for us, Lord. Open the eyes of our hearts to hear, to see your word this morning. And God, may you go before me as much as I have prepared for this sermon, oh God. Uh, may you be the one to just review your biblical truths to all the youths here listening to me on Zoom. And God, may you bless this time, uh, that you will be time, uh, the life-changing time for all of us, Lord that we may find a solution to how we can overcome our sins today. So I commit this time into your loving hands. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we all know Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. But how is the cross the effective solution to our present day sins? But how can the cross help us overcome our sins today? Sins such as lust, like watching porn on a computer, or jealousy, envying a classmate who is more popular than you in class, or rage, lashing it out on your parents when things don't go well at home, or sloth, not finishing homework on time due to laziness, or pride, just thinking that we are better than everyone else around us. So how is the cross the solution to all these crazy and nasty things that we do or we potentially can do today? How can the cross help us? So this is the question I hope to answer uh, in our passage in Romans 6 today. But let me first begin by giving us the wrong answer. Okay, this is the wrong answer. Okay, please get me right. This is not the right answer. This is the wrong answer. I'm giving us this wrong answer because this is perhaps what many of us might believe. And I hope that we can actually correct this wrong belief with scripture. This is how some people think that the cross is the solution to their sin. Well, they think of the cross as an immunity to continue sinning. And they think of God's grace as a license to sin. So I'm not sure this thought has ever crossed your mind. Right, that because Jesus has died on the cross for me, he has forgiven all my sins, then it's okay for me to sin. It's okay to keep on sinning. 
Well, because after all, Jesus has forgiven all my sins. After all, God's grace covers all the sin I have committed and will commit in the future. I'm not sure whether this thought has actually crossed your mind. And at the back of your mind, I'm not sure if you have actually given up trying to stop sinning. You have actually given up that you can actually stop sinning. You have given up hope to sin less. And being resigned, um, you know, you just tell yourself, I think it's okay to fall into sin. Because of the cross, you know, later on, I'm just going to ask God for forgiveness. Let me sin and then ask God for forgiveness. You know, God knows I tried all I can. Uh, God, God knows that I'm going to sin in this manner. You know, I'm just hopeless. Let me sin and then ask for God's forgiveness later. I actually wonder if this thought has actually crossed your mind. Well, I want to let you know this is actually a wrong understanding of the cross. This is a wrong understanding of how the cross actually solves the problem of our sins, our present day sins, the sins that we commit on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what I call, uh, it is also a gross uh, misconception of grace. Right? God's grace is not given to us as this license to sin. Right? A license to sin where you know, we can just sin as many times as we want because God's grace covers it. Right? That's a misconception of God's grace. It's a wrong understanding of God's grace. And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, actually corrects this wrong understanding and gross misconception of grace. But he poses this question in verse 1 that says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And then he goes on to answer his own question in verse 2, with a very strong, by no means. In some versions it says, May it never be. By no means should we keep on sinning so that grace may increase. By no means should we continue to sin because God has already given us grace to sin. You know, by no means should God's grace be a license for us to sin and a cross be taken as an immunity to continue to sin. This is a wrong understanding, okay, a misconception of God's grace. That is not grace. And so there's this one chapter book called Jude in the Bible. And Jude calls out and alerts his readers of this particular group of people within the church in verse 4. Let me read. He says, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. No, in other words, these are people who have this gross misconception about God's grace that it's okay to sin again and again and again and again because grace has been given and cross, the cross is the immunity to our sin. And this is a false doctrine that is sometimes called hyper-grace. Okay? Hyper-grace. If you're interested, uh, you may want to Google about it, hyper-grace, and read about it after this service. And so Jude says these are the people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality. At the same time, he says they deny Jesus Christ. In other words, they're not even Christians. And that's what he's actually saying. So this is the wrong answer to how the cross is the solution to our present day sins. The cross is not this immunity for us to continue sinning. The grace that's given from the cross is not a license to sin. Now what then is the correct answer? The correct answer can be found when we look at the story of Nebula. And this story of Nebula is going to relate to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. And this is where I like to suggest Nebula's story is also our story. I like to just use Nebula, Nebula's story in the Avengers to just help us to illustrate two things in our own lives. 
by our relationship with sin and also how the cross offers us this two-part solution to our present sin. Relationship with sin and how the cross actually gives us a solution, the real solution to our present-day sinfulness. So let's begin with how nebula illustrates our relationship with sin. Now, one of the things that's interesting about Nebula and the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is that Nebula is both an Avenger and he's also, she's also a villain. Okay, that's really interesting. Okay, unlike Iron Man or Captain America. Okay, her first appearance is in Guardians of the Galaxy, where she's actually introduced as a child of Thanos, the Mad Titan. So for those who have watched the movie, you know that Thanos is the main villain in the Avengers. His mission is to collect six infinity stones and to become this most powerful being in the universe. But then what he's going to do, he's going to destroy half of life in the entire universe. So Nebula is the child of Thanos. In the movie, Nebula also has this sibling rivalry with her sister, Gamora, okay, the, the, the one on the right. Here, yeah, Nebula has this deep-seated hatred for her sister, because Thanos, the father, who made both of them spar against each other, and each time when Nebula loses, she's actually forced to undergo some very painful cybernetic enhancements by Thanos. And Thanos uses, uses her as a weapon. All right, so Nebula is actually painfully made up. Okay, she, she bears a lot of pain from being forced to be you know, um, built by cybernetic parts that Th Thanos just periodically installs on her, defaces her for pretty much her entire life. But it's interesting that later on, as the movie progresses, the same Nebula, who is a child of Thanos, be becomes an Avenger. Okay, she teams up with the rest of the Avengers to try and stop her father, Thanos, from destroying the whole world. So this is pretty interesting, from villain to Avenger. So right now, I'm going to ask Aloysius to just help us to screen two clips from the Avengers movie. And I'd like us to take a look at this relationship between Nebula and Talos, Thanos. Okay, these two clips will give us a glimpse of uh, what is this relationship between Nebula and Thanos. So Aloysius is going to play the first two clips that you see on your weekly uh, back to back. Aloysius, please. Well, these are two clips that just give us a glimpse of the relationship between Nebula and her father, Thanos. Well, in the first clip, you see old Nebula's allegiance to Thanos. We see her just so supportive of her father's endeavors to get the Infinity Stones to accomplish his own purposes. And when Thanos gives her this mission, well, Nebula readily offers up herself to him. She bows in reverence to him. And if you have heard it carefully, she says this, I will not fail you, father. I swear, I will make you proud. Oh, right? Nebula wants to make her father proud. But now contrast this with Thanos' treatment of Nebula. Right, when, when Thanos discovers the threat of the Avengers and this new Nebula, nine years in the future, who has come back to stop him, right, we see Nebula, the old Nebula, simply just transform into a tool for Thanos to accomplish his own purposes. Nebula is just Thanos' weapon. Right, in the second clip, here we have Thanos torturing Nebula. Thanos torments her, subjects her to such cruelty just to get what he wants, to advance his own purposes. And may I suggest, this is actually a picture of our relationship with sin. Well, you know, although the old nebula caused Thanos her father, right, Thanos' relationship to her is more like one of a master. Okay, not so much like a father, but one like a master. And the old nebula is just a tool, a slave that exists for the only purpose to do the master's bidding. And you know, in the book of Romans, 
sin is described to us as our master. Paul introduced, introduces this idea that sin is like a master. Our relationship with sin is like a slave to master relationship, somewhat like nebulous relationship to Thanos. Romans chapter 7 verse 14 calls us a slave to sin. We are sold as a slave to sin. And Romans chapter 6 verse 14 alludes to the fact that sin was once our master. And like Nebula, who does the will of Thanos, who readily offers herself up to Thanos, we do the will of sin. We obey the evil desires of sin. Sin is our master. And we readily offer up ourselves, our bodies, to sin as instruments of wickedness. We find pleasure in serving our master, sin. And here's where I'd like to just share a quote by John Piper, okay, which tells us why we actually sin. Allow me to just read this quote for us. John Piper says this, right? No one sins out of duty. We sin because sin offers some promise of happiness. That promise enslaves us until we believe that God is more desirable than life itself. Only the power of God's superior promises in the gospel can emancipate our hearts from servitude to the shallow promises and fleeting pleasures of sin. This is what John Piper says. So in other words, without God, our hearts are in servitude to the shallow promises and fleeting pleasures of sin. We sin because we find pleasure in serving sin. We believe that sin offers us a promise of happiness. Well, one watches porn in lust because it believes, one believes that it offers pleasure and a promise of happiness. One steals in greed because it offers pleasure and a of promise of happiness. One is rude to one's parents in rage because it offers pleasure and a promise of happiness. One chooses to play video games instead of doing homework in laziness because it offers pleasure and a promise of happiness. And one puts others down in pride because it offers pleasure and a promise of happiness. That is why we all sin, because sin offers us pleasure and a promise of happiness. But oftentimes sin, like Thanos, is a very cruel master. It gives us, it offers us only a false promise of pleasure or happiness. Sin doesn't really return us with good when we obey its desires, when we offer ourselves up to it. And rather like Thanos, sin tortures us, sin destroys us, sins rip away true happiness from us. And it is this cruel master that inflicts us with pain and broken promises. That is sin to us. So when one watches porn in lust, that person ends up with that tormented soul of guilt and shame. The one who is rude to parents in rage often ends up with much emotional pain and heartache of that wounded family relationship. The one who puts others down in pride often ends up becoming that incredibly lonely soul that is so isolated and feels abandoned. That is what sin returns to us. It offers us a false promise of happiness, but it returns us with pain and broken promises. But like Nebula, oftentimes we feel as if we have no escape from such a cruel master called sin. Not until a saviour came to free us. And this saviour came not just to free us from the consequence and penalty of sin, the saviour came also to free us from the power and the whole of sin. This is a saviour that gives us a new life. The saviour that gives you a new you. As the story goes, old Nebula met the Avengers and she was freed from Thanos. She became new Nebula. But then there was still one problem. Old Nebula still existed. 
that Thanos serving Nebula still exists. And the next clip will probably show us what new Nebula did to old Nebula that will once and for all end this problem of old Nebula in her life. So I'm going to invite Aloysius to play this last clip for us. Let's take a look at what new Nebula did to old Nebula. You're weak. I'm you. That's enough. You disgust me. But that doesn't mean you're you. Stop. You're betraying us. You don't have to do this. I am this. No, you're not. You've seen what we become. Nebula, listen to her. You can change. No! the only solution that new nebula has to deal with old nebula was old nebula's death that was the only solution to old nebula it is why youths i like to present this solution this is the same solution actually that the cross offers us to deal with the problem with our own, own sinfulness, the problem with our own self, the problem with that sinful self that we have and all the sins that we commit today. And that solution is none other than death. Old Nebula hates new Nebula. But we can see from the clip that she's just so disgusted by that good change that came about in new Nebula, now becoming an Avengers. Avenger, right? And then in the, in, in the subsequent part, uh, we, we see new Nebula saying to old Nebula, right, you don't have to serve Thanos. You don't have to do this. You don't have to shoot your sister Gamora. But this is what old Nebula says. She says this impactful three words. But I am this. I am this. She cannot change. She cannot help but serve Thanos and to do his beating. And I wonder if this is you in your relationship to sin. I am this. Cannot change. Cannot help but sin. And so the only solution left for new Nebula to deal with old Nebula was death. Old Nebula had to die. And this is exactly what Romans chapter 6 verses 2 to 11 is actually talking about. This is where Paul presents to us the solution to our sins, the solution to our present day sinfulness. It's found in verse 2 and it's found in this phrase. We are those who have died to sin. And he carries on to say, how can we live in it any longer? This is the solution to our present day sinfulness. The solution is our death to sin. Paul says we have died to sin. Now I want us to read this verse very carefully. Okay, Paul didn't say sin has died to us. That's not what he says here. He says we have died to sin. And so Paul reasoned since we have died to sin, we can no longer live to sin. This is Paul's argument here. The solution to our present sinfulness is our death, our death to sin. Now, I believe this is going to sound quite confusing to some of you. At this point, some of you might probably ask, you know, PG, 
What does it mean to die to sin? What does it mean by our death to sin? No, aren't I, am I not alive? Am I not breathing? I'm surely not dead. So what's Paul talking about? About our death to sin? At the same time, this question you probably ask is, how is this death to sin going to solve the pro- current problem of my sins today in my life? How is this going to solve? How can dying to sin help solve all this sinfulness that I, that I have today in my life? Well, firstly, Paul is not talking here about a physical death. Okay, this is not a physical death when he says you have died to sin. It's not a physical death. But Paul is talking about a spiritual death. And this is a death that actually has already happened to us. When did this death happen? Well, this is going to be quite interesting. When did this spiritual death, when did we die to sin? Paul tells us in verse 6, he says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we have we will also live with him. Two highlighted phrases I like to point you to that tells us when this death has happened. Our old self was crucified with him. That spiritual death has already taken place. When? The other highlighted phrase, we have died with Christ. That spiritual death, our spiritual death has taken place when? At the cross. At the cross. That's when Jesus died. And when Jesus died at the cross, at the same time, we spiritually died. So now remember I said that this is going to be connected to last week's sermon. Right? How is it that Jesus' death on the cross is connected to our spiritual death. How is it that when Jesus died at the cross, we also spiritually died at the cross? Well, the answer is because Jesus died as us. Jesus died as us. Right? We died with Christ. When Christ died to sin at the cross, we died to sin at the cross. When Christ died as us, that's when our spiritual death happened. Our old self, as verse 6 says, was crucified with him. Although we are not even born, we are born 2,000 years later. But back then, our spiritual death happened when Jesus' physical death happened. Right? Our spiritual death to sin has already taken place at the cross. That's our sinful self. Okay? The old self is our sinful self. That example of old nebula, Paul says this old nebula, this old self that we have, has already died on the cross when Jesus died on our behalf. And this is what Paul probably means uh, when, in verse 2 when he says, you know, we are those who have died to sin. He doesn't say we are dying to sin, but he refers to an event back in the past to say we have already died to sin. Now this is a little complicated, but I hope you're following with me. But having understood what it means then that we have died to sin. The next question is pretty important. How is our death to sin then the solution to our present day sinfulness? Okay, how is it even related? The answer lies in verse 6 and 7. And this is what happened when we died to sin. But right, verse 6 says this, the body root by sin, our body that is root by sin, is done away with. It's done away with. Old nebula is done away with. And so basically, this is what the cross did to us. O, insert your own name, has died on the cross. Sinful, insert your own name, has died on the cross. This is the solution that Paul offers us to our present day sinfulness. right? That old you, that sinful you, in spiritual terms, it is gone, it is dead when Jesus died on the cross for you. Old nebula, that old you, that sinful you, who served Thanos, who served sin, is dead. And today, 
you are like new nebula. You are now free to live as an avenger. You are no longer the slave of Thanos. Thanos is no longer your master. Thanos has no more power over you. You are a new creation. The old you has passed away. And now you are able to live a new life as a new person with a new master who is Jesus Christ. And this is what the cross actually did for us. It, it put that sinful self, our sinful self, to death. So that today, we no longer need to be this sinful self. This person that sins and sins and sins and sins and sins again and again and again. Paul is saying to us, that person actually has really died at the cross. And so, this is what the cross did to us. Right? It, it put us to death. It put our sinful self to death. How then can we overcome sin in our life? Okay, okay let's go to the second part. Um, we talk about relationship with sin. Now I'd like to just be a little bit more explicit to talk about how the cross offers us this two-part solution to our present sinfulness. Okay, first, the first part of the solution. It's about accepting our death. The, the cross says our sinful self, the old us, has been put to death. And the first thing we need to do to overcome our present day sinfulness is to believe this and to accept it. We need to accept the death of our sinful self. So Romans chapter 6 verse 11 that concludes the segment says this, in the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Other Bible versions would say, consider yourself dead to sin. Consider is, is present, right? Present tense. Consider yourself dead to sin. KJV will say, reckon yourself dead to sin. Live as if you are dead to sin. This is what new Nebula did. She lived as if she's dead to Thanos, her father. She considered that old nebula that served Thanos as dead. She accepted that death of her old self, that past nebula, that evil nebula, that sinful nebula. It's all gone. And that's probably the first thing we need to do, like nebula, to overcome the present day, day sins in our life. We need to accept, we need to come to and reconcile with the fact that sin is no longer our master. Unlike non-believers, where sin is still their master, we as Christians have a new master, Jesus Christ. And that old self, that old us that serves sin, has been nailed to the cross. He has died. That old self has died. We need to call ourselves dead to our old master that is sin. And call ourselves alive to our new master who is God in Jesus Christ. Thanos is no longer new nebula's master. New nebula no longer serves Thanos. Old nebula that serves Thanos has already been buried. Okay, let me bring your context into what I'm actually talking about uh, in a very practical sense. You know, for Christians, there's actually this one act, okay, this one ritual that symbolizes this death to our old self, this burying of our old sinful self with Jesus Christ. And that act is actually baptism. It's baptism. If you read verses 3 and 4, right, this is what Paul is actually saying. Do you, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism in death in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. It is why I believe baptism is such an essential ritual for the Christian it's not a meaningless ritual. But what baptism symbolizes is actually death to our sins, to our past sinful self. It symbolizes death. And we choose baptism. When we choose the path of baptism, we are saying, I have died. All the sins that, the kind of sinful ways that I've lived before knowing Christ, I want to put it to death. I want to take Jesus Christ's death on the cross as my own death. That is baptism. It's bearing 
ourselves, considering ourselves dead with Christ Jesus, so that henceforth we can live a new life, a life that is freed from the power of sin. And so the first thing we need to do is to accept our own death. So there's this decisive act of accepting the end of our old lives, the end of old nebula that all Christians have to go through, and that is baptism. Right? That's the first part of the solution that the cross offers us today for our present sinfulness. But now let's look at the second part of the solution, and that involves staying dead. Okay, staying dead. Now we need to accept that we have died. Okay, our own sinful self has died across. We need to we need to consider that, reckon that. Okay, take the act of baptism. But at the same time, we need to ensure that our old sinful self stays dead. Okay, what do I mean here? Okay, Paul, Paul says this in Romans chapter six, verse twelve to fourteen. Right. Um, bear in mind this 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 series of three verses follows verse eleven that tells us to count ourselves dead to sin. So this is like a continuation. Right, cause how did dead to sin, and then he says, "Therefore, do not let rain sin rain in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those that have been brought um, back from death to life. Offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because." You're not under law, you're under grace. You know, our old selves have to be considered dead, yes. But this, this series of three verses is telling us that we cannot, we should not resurrect our old self. That old self needs to stay dead. Right? We should not be, be bringing our old selves, living like our old selves again. It takes effort on our part. Okay, that's not Christ's work. This is our work. Do not let sin. Paul is talking to people here. He said, telling them, do not let sin, right? Effort on our part. Not to let sin become the master again. Because Jesus Christ is now the master. It requires effort on our part. Not to offer up ourselves to sin. Serve sin once again as instruments of wickedness. But rather, we should offer ourselves up to God as instruments of righteousness. So if we are not careful, new nebula can be transformed into old nebula. Simply by choosing to serve Thanos once again. And that could be us. When, though we are Christians, we, just, we serve a new master, but if we are not careful, we can choose to serve our old master, which is sin once again. We can be involved in sin once again. We resurrect that old nebula in us, and we live like the old nebula all over again. So this second part is pretty important. We need to stay dead. We need to stay buried and consider that we are dead, but we, we, need, we need to say, you know, we have that old, that old self has to stay dead. And so this is the two-part solution of the cross uh, for our present day sinfulness. We need to accept the death of our old sinful self at the cross. But secondly, we also need to make sure that this old sinful self you know, stays dead. We no longer serve it. We no longer serve sin. And so this is how the cross is the effective solution to our present day sins, right? This is the correct answer. I'm going to give you the correct answer now. The cross doesn't offer this so-called immunity for us to keep on sinning, right? But rather, it actually offers us death to sin. It offers us that death to sin. Not sins dying to us, but we dying to sin. Right, the cross puts our own sinful self to death, our old sinful self to death, sorry. The cross frees us from sin as our master. Like today, right now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, sin is no longer your master. You do not have to do its beating. Right? And thirdly, the cross offers us death to sin by giving us a new power to overcome sin. And let me share with you what this new power is called. It's called grace. Okay, grace. Grace is not a license to sin, but this is what grace is, according to Romans chapter 6. Grace is the power of the cross that keeps us from sin. When do you know you're under grace? Not when you continually sin 
and feel like God is going to forgive you continually and you just keep on continuing in sin. That's not when you're under grace. You're under grace when you know there is a power keeping you from sin. There's something that has changed in you that's keeping you from the sin that you once loved and making you hate the sin that you once loved. That is grace. Grace is the power of the cross that keeps us from sin. Grace is the power of the cross that also enables us to walk in freedom from sin. Not to walk with sin, right? But in freedom from sin. Grace is also the power of the cross that frees us from being slaves to sin. That we should continue to obey sin's desire. We can be freed from sin because Jesus Christ has freed us not just from the penalty of sin but also the power of sin. By giving us grace, that is what grace is. Right? Grace gives us the ability to say no to sin, to our previous master. No sin, you are no longer my master. I don't have to obey you. I don't have to do what you want me to do. You offer false promises in my life. You inflict me with pain. I now serve a new master, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is my new master. This is what grace is. Right? Grace is what helps us overcome the power of sin in our lives. It all goes back to what Jesus has done at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross for us, he freed us from the power and the hold of sin. Real power and hold of sin. The temptation loses its power. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave us this power, a new power within us. That's grace to overcome our sin, to make us feel less and less um, needing to sin. That's what grace does for us. And so in conclusion, I'd just like to end uh, in a few moments' time uh, by asking Matthew to lead us in a very interesting response song. Uh, this is a response song uh, written by Hugh Song called Empires. And interestingly, it was uh, finished about 40 minutes before it was played for the first time. And the lyrics of this song uh, is, is usually people would say, you know, I don't know what the songwriter is talking about. But with this sermon, um, this, is, this song is just so apt um, to just illustrate you know, what, what this is all about. This song draws attention to the fact that we are in fact empires. We are the battlegrounds. We are worlds. We are bodies. And there are two masters fighting to claim us, sin and God. But the good news is, one master has already won and the other master has already been defeated. And so if the master that's already won, now beneath our skin, there's a new creation. The night is done. Our chains are broken. The time has come and the wait is over. Our King is here. His name is Jesus. And let me just invite Matthew to lead us in this closing song. Matthew, please. <clears throat> Shall we um let's sing this new song? Um yeah.
the wait is over, the king is here, and his name is Jesus. This is love, thanks guys to heal the broken. This is love, bring life into the grave. Hear the sound, and the hearts cry out forever. Sing hallelujah, breathing in a brand new world. Oh, we are shadows. We are shadows of portraits, and bars of light and clay. Images of a maker, in there's called out as saints. Beneath our skin, a new creation, the night is done, our chains are broken, the time has come, the wait is over, the king is here, and his name is Jesus, this is the Thanks, guys, to heal the broken. This is love, leading life into the grave. Hear the sound, and our hearts cry out forever. Sing hallelujah, breathing in a brand new world. Oh. Thank you, Matthew. Use let us pray. I'm not sure what you're feeling um, as you have heard this sermon this morning. Maybe prior to this, you just felt a sense of hopelessness that you're just struggling with your sin. As if there's no more hope to overcome your sin. But here's the good news of Jesus Christ what he has done for us on the cross. He didn't just forgive us of our sins and pay the penalty of our sins, but he has also granted us power to overcome sin. He has granted us grace to walk away from sin. If we only would depend on his grace and not our own strength to overcome the sins in our life, and use this is just what I want to leave you with this here this morning. Even in this stay home period, I'm not sure how how you all of you are feeling, but in in Jesus Christ, there is hope. 
Would you trust him? Would you just put your hope in him? Whatever sins that you have in your life, it's not permanent. Trust Jesus and what he has done on the cross and he can take that sin away. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you for what your son Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us. I thank you, Lord, that we can really experience this power today in our lives to overcome sin. And for the youths here this morning who have not experienced this power, oh God, I pray that in your own way, you show them this power to overcome sin in their life. Help them to walk with you as master and no longer have sin as their master. Help them to turn away from sin, this cruel master, and to serve you to offer up their bodies to you as instrument of righteousness and show them, Lord, how these sins that once had a hold of their life is no longer powerful because of what Jesus has done. Show them, oh God. Even this stay home period, Lord, grant us victory over our sins. Grant us grace that can help us overcome our sins. And now use receive the Lord's benediction. May you count yourself as dead to sin, alive to God. And may the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, who shed his own blood for you, grant you grace so that sin will no longer reign in your bodies as master, but that your bodies may be offered up to God as an instrument of righteousness unto Him. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen. Service is now over, but we have one last thing. Uh, as you log out from service, uh, we're going to flash the um, offering uh, slide just up on the screen. And we'll keep this up for a couple of minutes and uh, just spend some time uh, with God in prayer as you um, consider to give uh, to Him.